As you see on the screen, today's lesson focuses on not only the struggle for Texas independence, but also the concept of annexation, meaning taking Texas and turning it from a so-called independent republic into an American state. Now, Mexico gained independence from Spain in 1821, so they tried to settle an age-old issue, how to get people to actually settle in Texas and California, because, you know, they were really sparsely settled. Spanish settlers didn't come as families looking for farmland, much like in the United States. They came to establish themselves at the top of the social hierarchy over the native populace. Now, this worked in urban areas like Mexico City and Lima, where there was a substantial population, but not so much in the sparsely populated rural areas. The Comanche and Apache also posed serious threats in these frontier, uh, frontier areas. Now, American Moses Austin was actually granted large tracts of lands from the Mexican government, ostensibly to kind of guard that northern frontier but he died before he could utilize it. So his son, Stephen F. Austin, ended up with over 100,000 acres of land that he sold to other American settlers, beginning in the late 1810s. So, well, 1819 is when he does this. Now, there were three simple rules that the Americans needed to adhere to. First rule, they need to convert to Catholicism, because that's really the language of or I should say that's the religion of Mexico. Most Americans are Protestant. Second, they needed to learn Spanish for the purpose of conducting official government business. Unfortunately, many still will speak and teach their children in English because they'll set up schools. And they weren't allowed to bring their slaves, which many of them did. There were 40,000 inhabitants of Texas at the eve of independence. And there were 150,000 settlers just one decade later. And the influx of settlers was alarming, but their refusal to adhere to these three guidelines as set out by the government in Mexico City was really infuriating to the Mexican officials. They vowed to increase their military presence in frontier areas, suspend further American immigration until it could be controlled, and they wanted to really stem the overt American influence in these areas. So all of this will eventually lead to conflict. Now, Stephen F. Austin is one of the seminal, we might say, founding fathers of Texas. He represents the old guard of legal immigrants who had mostly gotten along with Mexican officials, although Austin did find loopholes that allowed for slaves to come with their owners. Sam Houston was a protege of Andrew Jackson, and he kind of had an interesting past into uh, himself. However, he ends up in Texas to start a law firm, and when we say start a law firm, what he really wanted to do was ferment a rebellion that he could take credit for. He could be like the George Washington of Texas. He was backed by newer, often illegal immigrants to Texas, and they really have no loyalty to or interest in following Mexican laws. General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana ended up nullifying the new Mexican constitution, and he established himself as the sole ruler of Mexico. He even crushed a rebellion and allowed his soldiers to loot the city that he sacked, kind of as a warning that no one should cross him. This seemed proof that Americans in Texas needed to prepare for war, and Sam Houston seems to be the man of the hour. Now, after a brief victory at Gonzales, and we're just kind of going to speed through a lot of the events here of the actual independence movement, the Americans wrote up a Declaration of Texas Independence, and they declared themselves to be an independent republic. At around the same time, San Antonio, which had been captured and briefly held by a Texas garrison, was approached from the south by a Mexican force that numbered 4,000 strong. The Americans, consisting of men like Jim, uh, Jim Bowie and Davy Crockett, were holed up in a small Spanish mission called the Alamo, whose walls could provide some protection from the Mexican artillery. Commander William Travis was able to get a message beyond the siege requesting aid, but it came too late. So 187 men held out for as long as they could, and on day 13, General Santa Ana ordered an assault on the Alamo. He ordered that no prisoners be taken, because these men were considered invaders who wanted to steal Mexican land. All defenders were either killed in combat or executed. 
Now, the wife of one of the defenders was allowed to leave, along with her infant, and the other wives and children of the defenders who were at the Alamo were allowed safe passage, mainly as a warning, not necessarily to stir things up, otherwise there's going to be more trouble. Now, following the battle at the Alamo, nearly 300 Americans were killed or massacred at Goliath, and Santa Ana's policy of no prisoners became abundantly clear. And we get a good idea of where these places are as they occurred in terms of Mexicans' independence. So, Texans want revenge, and the garrison led by Sam Houston actually ignored they ignored Houston's orders to not march against the Mexican army, which was camped at San Jacinto. Now, he did eventually assume command, and as they leapt from their hiding places, they charged and screamed, Remember the Alamo! Remember the Goliath! And the Texans used Santa Ana's policy against his men, brutally killing almost all of the soldiers. Now, San Jacinto is considered the decisive victory of Mexican independence. Now, after Texas declares themselves independent, they thought themselves to be the Lone Star Republic. In the meanwhile, Mexico didn't really think they had ever officially left. There's some discrepancies there. President Andrew Jackson did want Texas as part of the Union, but he felt that the battle over this would take too much time away from his other foreign and domestic goals. So all he did was acknowledge their existence. That's about it. Now his successor, Martin Van Buren, really followed suit. So for about a decade, Texas will remain an independent republic. President John Tyler sought to change course, and this was mainly due to actions of the British. You know, Texas was in terrible financial shape, and the British were prepared to help them out. This meant that the British would be near New Orleans if Texas comes under the thumb of the British, and they would undermine American interests in the Mississippi Delta. And since they were anti-slavery, they might harm the institution's ability to survive in the region. However, when annexation was proposed to Sam Houston, Houston rebuffed him because he did not want Congress to reject it. Informal polls kind of indicated that many congressmen were in favor of adding Texas as the 28th state in the Union, and former President Andrew Jackson even sent personal letters to his one-time protege, Sam Houston, indicating that this is something that should occur. A treaty was sent to the Senate for ratification, and the debate began over whether it was legal to do so or whether Texas was even still part of Mexico. Now, future President James K. Polk's favorable view on annexation was a reason that he got the Democratic nomination, so Tyler more aggressively pursued it, and under lame duck President Tyler, uh, very late December 1848, the treaty was ratified and Texas became the 28th state in the Union, thus setting down, uh, I should say, setting up a showdown with Mexico. 